Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about a case that I personally have been wanting to cover for years now. We are going to be discussing discussing the solved case of Colin Ireland. He was a serial killer from the UK who was dubbed the gay slayer by the media. Colin Ireland was responsible for the murders of five gay men which occurred in London in the early 90s and sickeningly his horrific crimes began after he made a New Year's resolution that he was going to become a serial killer. But quickly before we get into the case, I would just like to say a huge thank you to BBC iPlayer for kindly sponsoring this section of the video. Can't quite believe that I'm saying that, that I'm partnering with BBC iPlayer on a video because I've been using it for literally years and years now, since I was a child. BBC iPlayer is my go-to. It's my favorite service for watching my favorite TV shows. I use it pretty much every single day, mainly in the evenings when I finished work for the day and I'm trying to relax and wind down, I will get up BBC iPlayer on my TV and I will pick something on there to watch. They have so many different programs and shows for you to choose from. There is something for everyone on there. A documentary that I recently watched on BBC iPlayer is my Insta scammer friend, which is about Caroline Calloway, who used to be an infamous American social media influencer. The documentary is all about how during Caroline's time as an influencer, she used to be seen as this kind of online friend to a lot of her followers but after going through her fair share of viral scandals it left a lot of her followers feeling as though they had been duped and scammed by Caroline. I found the documentary so captivating and interesting. There was one part that really really stuck with me where after Caroline received all of this backlash and she was given the scammer status, instead of I guess trying to disprove it, she in a way used it to her advantage and she ran with it. She accepted this title that she had been given. The film explores the murky and almost toxic relationship between Caroline and her followers and it begs the question of how much do influencers really owe the people that follow them, the people who are Allow them to have the lifestyle that they do, the people who built the very foundations of their success. Like I said, it's such an interesting and gripping watch. I highly, highly recommend it and I really want to hear what you guys think about the documentary. So if you would like to watch my Insta Scammer Friend or if you want to check out the other programs that BBC iPlayer has to offer, then you can either scan the QR code that is on the screen right now or you can click the link at the top line of the description box which will take you straight to the BBC iPlayer website. Once again thank you so much to BBC iPlayer for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. Thank you to all of you watching for supporting the sponsors on this channel and now let's just get into the case. Before we continue please listen carefully to the following. This video is about the murders of several men and it involves heavy themes such as homophobia, violence towards the LGBTQ plus community, torture, animal cruelty, paedophilia and the theme of sexual assault is mentioned. Viewer describes is advised. So for this week's case we are going all the way back to the year 1954 in Dartford which is a town in Kent in the southeast of England. That is where Colin Ireland was born. He was born on the 16th of March 1954 and I couldn't actually find the names of his parents anywhere but they were both very young when Colin was born. They were just teenagers. His mother was only 17 years old when she gave birth and his father walked out on them. He decided that he didn't want any part of this family. And remember, this was the 1950s, so this was really frowned upon. Colin's mother had just had a child out of wedlock. She was still a child herself, really, and now she was a single mother. She was really kind of looked down on by people. Because she was now a single mother, she had to move back in with her parents, so Colin's grandparents, for a little while. And Colin's family never really had much money at all. They were very, very poor, and it was a struggle for his mother to 
provide for her son. And not only did they not have much money, but as Colin grew up, he never really had any stability in his life either. Apparently his mother would move them constantly. They were always moving around. At one point, his mother was struggling for money so much that they couldn't afford to live anywhere. So they lived in a homeless shelter for a period of time. And of course, because they kept moving to different areas, naturally, that meant that Colin had to keep moving schools. By the time he was just 10 years old, he had already been to six different schools. And obviously you don't start school till you're around like four or five years old. So if you think about it, that's a different school every single year. So I imagine as a result of this, he probably really struggled to make friends. He was always the new kid in school. So he was a bit of an outsider and a loner. He was teased and bullied a lot. Meanwhile, Colin's home life still really was not great. Apparently his mother was constantly seeing different men. She would have different men stay over all the time. But then in the early 1960s, she married. She got married to a man who then ultimately became Colin's stepfather and they had a child together. Colin was now a big brother. However, when this child came along, Colin's mother and his stepfather actually decided to put him in care. They decided that it would be too much for them to take care of both Colin and this baby. So they put Colin in foster care. And I can't imagine the emotional damage that this must have caused Colin. He had basically been kicked out of his home at such a young age. He would have been, I think, around his early teens by this point or just about to enter his early teenage years. And his mother had just cast him aside. Not only did his biological father decide to leave him all those years ago, Go, but now his mother had left him too. Although some sources do say that eventually she allowed him to come back home, but I'm sure that this would have left him with so much anger, anger that he didn't know how to control. And so he became very violent and aggressive. According to sources, around this time, he developed a bit of an obsession with starting fires. One time when Colin was staying at a ball stall because he was constantly in and out of those, he set fire to another boy's belongings. When Colin was just 12 years old, he was approached by a man, a paedophile, who offered him some money and presents if Colin agreed to engage in a sexual act with him. And this happened a few times, apparently. There are a few occasions over the years when Colin was the target of paedophiles. When he was 16 years old, Colin moved to London, and whilst he was there, he would often go to this amusement arcade. However, this particular arcade was reportedly a popular place for paedophiles. Paedophiles would go there and basically try to groom some of the children so we can assume that Colin became a target to sexual predators there as well. Colin Ireland became involved with crime from a young age. As I said, he was constantly in and out of Borstal institutions. When he was 16, he started committing theft. He was carrying out robberies, burglaries. He was still starting fires. And he was caught for a number of these crimes. He was arrested and he would have to appear in court to face punishment. But despite that, he didn't change his ways. And as he entered adulthood, he was now constantly in and out of prison. He built up a lengthy criminal record, again for crimes like theft, car theft, but also criminal damage, deception, fraud. During his time out of prison, he would try and find work, but he never really stayed in one job for very long. He was always going from job to job. At one point, he actually had a job working as a bouncer for a gay nightclub, which is quite interesting considering what he would go on to do later in his life. I wonder if maybe working there played some kind of part in that. But anyway, in 1981, when Colin was around 26 years old, he met a woman named Virginia Zamet. They met at a survivalist meeting. Colin Island was very interested in that kind of thing, survivalism. He was very interested in practicing outdoor survival skills. He would often go on survival trips and retreats and yeah, that's where he met Virginia. They started dating and just the year following this in 1982, they got married married and he became a stepfather because she actually already had a child. And at first, Colin was described as being pretty much the perfect husband. I believe Virginia was disabled, she was in a wheelchair, and he looked after her all the time. He was even given the nickname the Gentle Giant because he was so caring, but he was also 
absolutely huge. As an adult, Colin was a very, very tall, muscly man. So he was a very respectable man and it would appear as though he and Virginia had a good marriage until she discovered that her loving husband was a cheat. He was being unfaithful and having an affair with another woman and so Virginia divorced Colin in 1987. Following the divorce, Colin relocated to the county of Devon in the southwest of England and it was whilst he was living there when in 1989 he met the woman who would go on to become his second wife. Her name was Janet Young. Now Janet owned a pub in Devon called the Globe Inn. One day Colin walked into the pub, he got chatting to Janet, they got along very well and they quickly started dating. In fact after just three months of dating they got married. They tied the knot in early 1990. However this relationship broke down and ended almost just as quickly as it began. Just like with his first marriage initially Colin seemed to be the perfect husband but then he soon started to show his true colours and he became quite abusive towards Janet. There was one occasion where one night they had a pretty big argument whilst they were in their bedroom and Colin literally grabbed Janet. He pushed her out of the room and she was terrified. She was scared of Colin so she ran into one of the other bedrooms and she shut the door behind her but Colin wouldn't leave her alone. He was banging on the door repeatedly demanding that Janet let him in and when he finally did get in the room with her he smashed the light bulb in the light so that it was pitch black in that room and Janet couldn't see a thing. And after this, he began walking around the room, standing in different corners and he was calling Janet's name. He was saying, Janet, I'm here. Now I'm over here, Janet. And she was so frightened, as you can imagine. He was just taunting her and Colin was getting enjoyment out of this. He was enjoying watching his wife be so scared of him, which is so sick and twisted. As far as I'm aware, Colin was never physically abusive towards his wife but he was definitely mentally and emotionally abusive and just four months after they married they separated. However the events leading up to this separation are just insane. Basically one day I think around Easter time in 1990 Janet and her kids went to London for a few days to visit friends leaving Colin in Devon alone and whilst Janet was in London Colin decided that he was going to leave his wife he didn't want to be with her anymore so he was gonna pack his things and leave before she came back without saying anything without speaking to her first or even letting her know that he was leaving but before he did Colin decided to steal from Janet he took all of the money out of her bank account took a load of her belongings from the pub and he went. He moved all the way to Southend on Sea in Essex and Janet never saw him again. When Janet realised what her husband had done, she did get in contact with the police. She even reported Colin as missing, but I don't think the police ever traced him. It was clear to them that he was just a con man. And of course, Janet really struggled after this. She had absolutely no money now. Colin had stolen everything from her, so she was completely broke. I believe she lost the pub and she even even had to live with her children in a homeless hostel for a while. But Colin Island clearly didn't care about any of that and he began building a new life for himself in South End. In 1991, Colin Island started working, believe it or not, at a homeless shelter in South End. He was a volunteer there actually and despite what he had done to Janet, despite the fact that he had caused her to become homeless, Apparently he really enjoyed this job. He enjoyed helping out at the homeless shelter. He was very passionate about his job. It's believed that he felt that this was his way of giving back to society and almost redeeming himself in a way. He fully admitted to his colleagues at the shelter that he had done some bad things. He was very open about, you know, his past and his criminal record and how he wanted to give back and do his bit now. Eventually, Colin actually became the deputy manager at the homeless shelter, although he didn't actually always get along very well with his co-workers. It's been reported that some of his colleagues found him to be quite rude. They felt as though he was kind of arrogant and domineering. Some of them were even a little bit scared of him, I think. There was just something about him that scared them. And he wasn't always that great with the homeless people who came to the shelter either. One of his colleagues 
Reese Richards said in a documentary that I watched how there was this one time when Colin described in detail how he would kill this one particular homeless person that came in. Apparently this client could cause a little bit of trouble sometimes at the shelter and Colin described how he would shut him up and get rid of him by forcing snooker balls down his throat so that he would choke and die. His colleague Richard probably didn't think too much into it at the time. I mean, he probably thought that it was a very weird comment to make, but no one could have predicted what Colin would go on to do. Eventually, Colin Ireland was fired from the homeless shelter after allegations were made by some of his female co-workers of inappropriate touching. So he was asked to leave, and after this, he found himself another job, I think doing, like, manual labour, which he didn't really enjoy too too much and I don't know if he actually stayed in this job for very long and so because he didn't enjoy his work life anymore I think he was trying to do more things in his spare time that he did enjoy so for example he was still practicing his outdoor survival skills and he was also reading a lot and there was this one particular book that Colin Island really really liked it was called Whoever Fights Monsters by Robert Ressler now Robert Ressler used to work for the FBI. He was an FBI profiler and the book is all about the murders and the serial killer investigations that he had been involved in and how the FBI handled serial killer cases, all of that kind of stuff. And as I said, Colin loved this book. He was so, so interested in it. In fact, it turns out that this book was one of the things that inspired him to eventually commit murder. By the new year of 1993, Colin Island was around 38, 39 years old. He was still living in South End. He was alone. He wasn't enjoying his work life. He really didn't have much going on in his life, to be honest. And he was bored. He wanted to do something. He'd actually decided that he wanted to become known, he wanted to be famous, even if he had to do something so evil for that to happen. He didn't care, he was willing to do it, he craved notoriety. And so in January of 1993, Colin Island made a New Year's resolution, like many of us do every single year. However, Colin's New Year's resolution this particular year wasn't the standard, you know, eat a bit healthier, maybe drink less, etc, etc. Colin Island's resolution was that this year, 1993, he was going to become a serial killer. Just like the criminals that Robert Ressler had written about in his book, Colin Island wanted to be just like them. That was how he was going to get notoriety, how he was going to get the attention that he so desperately craved by becoming an evil murderer. And Colin had decided that the people he was going to target, his victims, were all going to be gay men. Now there are a few theories as to why Ireland decided that he was going to kill exclusively gay men. Number one is that he was homophobic, which he himself said that he was. He said that he did not like gay people, he didn't agree with homosexuality, and so he wanted to get rid of them and torture them. He felt as though they needed to be punished. It's also been theorised that he believed that murdering specifically gay men would be easier to get away with because this was the early 90s. There was still a lot of homophobia at this time. There was probably homophobia in the police force. So perhaps he felt that the police wouldn't really care too much to find the person that was going around killing gay people. I also came across a theory online that because Colin was targeted by by sexual predators when he was a teenager. He was targeted by paedophiles, of which were all men. He developed this belief that these predators who were interested in him were gay and that gay was bad. He didn't grasp that no, they weren't interested in him because they were gay and he was a boy. They were interested in him and they were targeting him because he was a child and they were paedophiles. He didn't seem to get that. It's been theorised that in his mind, being gay and being a sex offender was the same thing almost, I don't know. But another theory surrounding why Colin Ireland decided to target gay men, a theory which a lot of people do believe, is that he himself was gay and he couldn't accept that. I don't want to spend too long on this because, you know, I don't want to question or speculate someone else's sexual orientation. But Colin grew up in a time when I would say most people were homophobic, when members of the LGBTQ plus community were victims of 
bullying and harassment and violence. So perhaps he was secretly gay or maybe bisexual or something, but he never felt as though he could express that. Instead, he pushed it down, he kept it quiet, and maybe he resented other gay people. He resented gay men who were out because they didn't keep their sexuality a secret. They were unapologetically themselves, and he was jealous of that. And this resulted in a lot of anger towards them, and he wanted to take this anger out on them. Maybe he was attracted to men and the killings were sexually motivated, but as I said, he himself always said that he was homophobic. When he was asked by the police after his murder spree if he was gay, he said no, he always denied it. And maybe he really wasn't, maybe he really was just a straight man and a homophobic asshole like he said he was, or perhaps there was some internalised homophobia there, who knows? But going back to where we were, in early 1993, 38-year-old Colin Ireland made himself a New Year's resolution that he was going to kill gay men and become a serial killer. And just a couple of months after his resolution was set, he put his plan into action and began looking for his first victim. And it wasn't long before he found his hunting ground, so to speak. He discovered a place where he was going to pick up his victims. It was a pub in southwest London called the Colhun Pub. Now the Colhun Pub back in the early 90s was incredibly popular with the gay community. Gay men in particular would go there often to meet other gay people, to find someone to hook up with. Apparently many of the men that went there were known to be into bondage and S&M, sadomasochistic sex, so they would try to find someone at the Colhun that was also into that kind of thing that they could sleep with. With. And so Colin Island decided that this was the perfect place to find potential murder victims. He had made a plan to go to the Colhern. He was going to, I guess, try and flirt with some of the men, pretend that he was gay and that he was into S&M and then hopefully one of the men would be interested in him and take him back to their home where Colin could strike an attack. So on the evening of the 8th of March 1993, Colin Island made his way to the Colhern and he came prepared. He actually had basically a murder kit with him. He brought a bag with things like handcuffs and rope and gloves etc. Anyway he went to the pub on the evening of the 8th of March and there he met a man named Peter Walker. Peter was 45 years old, he was from London, he lived in an apartment in Battersea in London and he worked as a theatre director. Peter was openly gay and he would often go to the Colham pub, he was a regular there. Sources state that Peter and Colin got chatting in the Colhern after Peter accidentally spilt some of his drink on Colin so he probably apologised this sparked conversation and Peter was interested in Colin so eventually he asked him if he wanted to come back to his apartment with him and Colin said yes. Once they arrived Peter put his dogs into the living room, he had two dogs so he put them in there, shut the door and then he took Colin into to his bedroom and once they were in his bedroom Colin tied Peter to the bed. Now Peter probably wouldn't have thought much of this, you know he was into this kind of thing, it's believed that he was into bondage and S&M so he had no reason to panic or anything. Little did he know of Colin Island's very very sinister intentions. Colin hadn't come to Peter's home for sex, he'd come to kill him and as soon as Peter was tied up that's exactly what what he proceeded to do. Colin started to whip Peter. Some sources state that he began just beating him with his fist. He began punching him over and over again and then eventually he grabbed a plastic bag, he put it over Peter's head and he held it there until Peter died. He suffocated Peter Walker to death. However, that wasn't enough for Colin Ireland. Murdering this poor man wasn't enough for him. He wanted to basically staged the scene. He wanted to pose Peter Walker's body in a way that would not only further humiliate him but would also just shock and traumatise whoever it was that found him. So he left Peter's body on the bed but he got a condom and he placed it on Peter's face, over his face. Although some sources say that he actually put the condom into Peter's mouth and there was also one stuffed inside his nose. He also grabbed two teddy bears and he placed them in the 
69 position on Peter's bed next to his body and he got a lighter and even though Peter was already dead he decided to set his pubic hair on fire because apparently he wanted to see what it would smell like. Once he was satisfied with how he posed Peter's body he put all of the ligatures and rope that he had used during the murder in his bag. He put everything that he brought with him in his bag. He was careful not to leave anything behind. He tidied up a little bit. He wiped any surfaces that he had touched to get rid of any fingerprints. He was very forensically aware. And then he actually stayed in the flat with Peter's dead body that whole night. He didn't leave until the next morning. And the reason for this was because he didn't want to walk out onto the street with his murder kit in the middle of the night because he was worried that someone would spot him. So like if there was a police officer walking around, he might stop Ireland and ask to look in his bag or something and then he would probably be caught. So he decided to wait till the next morning when everyone would be awake, the streets would be busy because everyone would be headed to work and then he could just slip out and he wouldn't stand out to anyone. So that is exactly what he did. He waited until around 7am. He left Peter's flat and he walked to the train station where he got a train which took him back to Southend in Essex where he was still living at the time. And actually it was whilst he was on the train that he was getting rid of the items that he had used during the murder. As the train was moving he was throwing the items like the rope and the handcuffs and stuff out of the window. He'd also stolen Peter's bank card from his flat. One documentary that I watched actually said that before he killed Peter he tortured him to force him to reveal his card number and then after the murder he took it to an ATM and withdrew about £200 and that was it. He just committed his first murder and it seemed as though he'd pulled it off. He'd gotten away with it. Now Colin was absolutely desperate to read about Peter's murder in the news. He wanted to see it on the TV and in the newspapers because remember that was a big part of this for him. One of the main reasons he did this was for attention. He craved attention. He wanted people to know about Peter's gruesome death. And so not long after the murder he decided to make two phone calls. One to the Samaritans which is a a mental health support charity that we have here in the UK and the second call that he made was to the Sun newspaper. He rang a journalist from the Sun and he basically said that he had a story for them. He of course didn't give over his name but he told this journalist about this flat in Battersea in London which two dogs were locked inside of and he said that the dogs were locked in there, they were stuck in this flat because he had just murdered their owner, Peter Walker, and then he hung up the phone. So after receiving this phone call, the Sun newspaper immediately contacted the police who went straight to Peter's flat. However, by this point, I think Peter's body had already been found. It had literally just been discovered by a friend of his, a colleague who was worried about Peter when he didn't show up for work that morning. So he went to his flat to see if he was okay. He got the caretaker of the building to open the door and that was when Peter Peter was found. Obviously as soon as Peter's body was discovered the police launched an investigation into his death and a forensic team was sent in to search the flat but to be honest they didn't find much. As we know Colin made sure of that. He cleaned up after the murder. He made sure to wipe away any fingerprints so unfortunately not much evidence was obtained. And from what I can gather Colin made the calls to the Samaritans and the Sun newspaper from a public phone box so the police couldn't trace them. All of this meant that this murder was going to be very difficult to solve but in an attempt to solve it the media began reporting on the crime. They were trying to get it out there to hopefully generate some tips and leads and the detectives also made the decision to turn to the gay community in London for help. The police had established by this point that Peter Walker was gay and that he was last seen at the Colham pub. So the police went to the Colham pub to ask the regulars there if they had any information about the murder, any information about who Peter may have gone home with that night. However the issue was the gay community weren't really willing to cooperate and speak to the police. They didn't trust them understandably and a police investigation that was ongoing at this time called Operation Spanner had a huge part to play in that. Operation Spanner began I believe around the late 80s and it was a metropolitan police investigation into 
sadomasochistic sex between gay men in the UK. Back then in the late 80s, S&M between same-sex males was viewed as unacceptable and wrong by the police and the government, even when both partners were consenting and even if it was in the privacy of their own homes. It was seen as, well, a criminal offence. Gay men were being prosecuted if the police believed they were engaging in S&M. And of course, around this time, gay men were also under a lot of scrutiny because of the 80s AIDS crisis. People still blamed them for that. They believed that it was their fault and that they were the ones who were spreading this disease. And so there was a lot of homophobia because of that. Police were also raiding gay clubs in London at the time and they were wearing rubber gloves because they thought that if they didn't, they would catch AIDS off of the homosexuals that went there, even though you can't catch AIDS just from skin on skin contact. So the LGBT community were facing a lot of backlash from all of this. As I said earlier, there was still a lot of homophobia around this time from the government, the general public, and also in the police force. So yeah, as I was saying, sorry, I went off on a bit of a tangent there, but the gay community did not trust the police, especially because of Operation Spanner. It was just ironic how the police were going to the Colham pub asking the regulars there if they had any information about Peter Walker's murder. They were asking the men their questions about S&M, if they had ever engaged in S&M with someone from the pub before, because obviously it was clear that Peter's killer had pretended to engage in S&M in order to tie him up. They were asking all of these questions and the gay community were basically just like, well, how can we be honest? How can we tell you if we have engaged in S&M? Because if we do, there's every chance that you'll prosecute us for it. In fact, I believe it was just a few days after Peter Walker's murder when it was ruled that gay men could be arrested and charged with assault if they had engaged in S&M sex, sex that caused bodily harm, even if it was consensual. So yeah, the gay men in the pub were reluctant to help because they were scared. They didn't want to get involved. And I think this was one of the many reasons why the investigation into the murder of Peter Walker ultimately went cold. The police could not identify the person that did this to him. It seemed as though Colin Island really had gotten away with it. And so after a few months, he felt confident enough to commit murder again. More than two months after the murder of Peter Walker, on the evening of the 28th of May, 1993, Colin Island left his home in Southend. He got on a train to London and he made his way to the Colham pub. And it was there where he met Christopher Dunn. Christopher was 37 years old at the time this case took place. He was also from London and he worked as a librarian. Christopher Dunn spotted Colin Ireland drinking at the bar in the pub. He approached him, they got chatting and eventually they agreed to go to Christopher's flat together. Christopher lived in an area in London called Wildstone. Once inside, Ireland tied Christopher to his bed just like he did with Peter Walker. And again, just like Peter Walker, at first Christopher probably just thought that this was a part of sex, but it wasn't long before Colin made clear his true intentions. He began torturing Christopher Dunn. He started burning him with a lighter. He forced him to give over his bank card and pin number. And then eventually Colin got a bit of cord and he wrapped it around Christopher's neck and started to squeeze. He was trying to strangle him to death. However, sickeningly, he didn't just strangle him as quickly as he could to get it over and done with. He would strangle Christopher Dunn until he was almost dead, until the life was literally draining from him. And then Island would let go. He would release the pressure and he would watch Dunn come around a bit and then he would start strangling him again. He did this over and over and over again because he was getting enjoyment out of it. And then eventually when he was satisfied, he finished the job. He strangled Christopher to death and claimed his second murder victim. Just like the first time after the murder, he cleaned the flat, wiped away any fingerprints. He left Christopher's naked body on the bed. He actually left him in a dog harness, I think. And then he waited in the flat until early the next day when he slipped away into the morning London rush. He took money from Dunn's bank account and he got on a train back to Southend. And it wouldn't be until two 
two days later when Christopher's body was found. He was found by a friend who became worried about him when there had been no contact from Christopher for a few days. This friend went to Christopher's flat and there he found him dead and the police were called to the scene. Now when Christopher's body was taken for a post-mortem, the medical examiner actually determined that his death may have been an accident. He said that he may have died as the result of like a sex act or a sex game gone wrong. This may not have been a cold-blooded murder. Of course we know that it was but the pathologist wasn't sure and so it wasn't treated as a murder by the police. They didn't launch a full-on murder inquiry. They just ruled what happened to Christopher as a suspicious death and so at the time they didn't make the connection between Christopher Dunn's death and the death of Peter Walker a few months earlier. They didn't realise that they were linked. So once again, Colin Island had escaped detection. He was free to kill again, which is exactly what he did just six days after his second murder. I mean, you can really see how much his confidence is growing here. Between his first and second murder, there was a much larger gap of time. He waited almost three months to kill again, but when he also wasn't caught after his second one, it gave him even more of a confidence boost and he did not hesitate to strike again. Colin Island's third victim was 35-year-old Perry Bradley. He was actually from America. He was an American businessman and he met Colin Island at the Colham pub on the evening of the 4th of June 1993. And after chatting for a while, the two men decided to go back to Perry's flat in Kensington in London. Now, Perry Bradley wasn't really into s and That just wasn't his thing and so when Colin Ireland suggested that he tie Bradley up, tie him to the bed, Bradley I think said no at first. He said that he wasn't into that but Colin basically said well I, I can't get sexually aroused unless I do that. I need bondage to get into it and so eventually Perry Bradley agreed to go with what Colin had said and as soon as Perry was tied up Colin began to threaten him. Once again he stole from his victim. I believe he took some cash from Perry's home and he also took his bank card and demanded that Perry tell him the pin number and then after this Colin said to Perry that he should try and go to sleep because he said that he wasn't going to leave his flat for a while he was going to hang around for a few hours so he said to Perry that he might as well get some sleep and after a while Perry did fall asleep and it was whilst he was sleeping when Colin attacked. He got some rope he put it around his neck like a noose and he strangled Perry Bradley to death with it. Afterwards he tidied up, he put the items that he brought with him in his bag and then the next morning he left and three days after Perry's murder his body was found by neighbours and it stated on a few sources that when he was found there was a doll sitting on his body. Colin Island had once again staged the scene and posed his victim. So now that's three murders, three innocent lives that Colin Island had taken and yet surprised Surprisingly, the three cases still were not linked by the police. They failed once again to realise that all three men, Peter Walker, Christopher Dunn and Perry Bradley, had been killed by the same person, despite the similarities that each murder shared. And because they weren't linked, each case was actually being investigated by a different police team. There were three separate police teams all working on this same inquiry, working to track down the same killer and they just didn't know it at the time. And it's believed that this probably angered Colin Ireland. He was losing his patience. He obviously hadn't seen anything in the media or on the news about the police having connected the cases. And he was frustrated that it was taking them so long and that he wasn't, he felt, getting enough publicity. And so to get their attention, he stepped up the killings. Once again, it would only be a matter of days until he claimed another victim. Later the same day that Perry Bradley's body was found, on the evening of the 7th of June 1993, Colin Ireland went to the Colham pub in search for his fourth victim. That evening he met a man named Andrew Collier who was 33 years old. He worked as a warden at a housing complex in North East London. After meeting, the two men went back to 
Andrew Collier's flat and there Colin tied Andrew up. He threatened Andrew Collier, demanded that he give him his PIN number for his bank card. Although apparently this time his victim refused. Andrew said no, he wasn't giving Colin Ireland his PIN. And so Colin proceeded to kill him. He used a ligature to strangle Andrew Collier to death. However, he didn't just brutally murder Andrew that night. He also murdered Andrew's cat. He strangled his cat to death as well. And I'm unsure who he killed first, whether he killed the cat and then Andrew or Andrew and then the cat. One source states that he killed the cat first. And it's actually believed that the reason he did this was because basically after the first murder, the murder of Peter Walker, it had been reported in the media that his killer was an animal lover. Because remember, he didn't harm Peter Walker's dogs. And after Peter's murder, Colin phoned the newspaper and the Samaritans saying that someone should go to the flat because two dogs were locked in there after he had murdered their owner. So this was reported in the media that Peter's murderer had a soft spot for animals. He loved animals and Ireland didn't want that. He didn't want to be seen as an animal lover. He didn't want to be seen as, I guess, merciful in any way. He just wanted to be seen as a cold-blooded killer. And so when it came to Andrew Collier's murder, he decided to strangle his cat too. But that wasn't all he did. He didn't just kill Andrew and the cat. After they were dead, he posed both of their bodies. Two days after Andrew's death, his dead body was found inside his flat and the police were called. And when they walked into Andrew's home, they were met with a truly, truly horrific, gruesome scene. And I just want to give a warning here. What we're about to talk about is very, very graphic and disturbing so if you do not want to listen to that skip to the time that is on the screen right now. When the police arrived at Andrew Collier's flat they found him lying on his back on the bed. He was naked and draped across his chest was his dead cat. There were two condoms in Andrew Collier's mouth and there was also a condom on his cat's tail and the cat's tail had been put inside of Andrew's mouth. There was also another condom on Andrew's penis and his penis had been put inside the dead cat's mouth. It's so sick and twisted. That is how Colin Island chose to position Andrew's body and I actually can imagine how much that scene would have traumatised the police and the crime scene investigators. It's unimaginable. Colin Island would later say that he left Andrew in this way. He did this to him because he felt so much anger towards him. Apparently, whilst he was at the flat, he discovered some medical papers which stated that Andrew was HIV positive. And Colin was angry that Andrew hadn't told him that, even though he had brought Colin back to his flat thinking that they were going to have sex. And so he took this anger out on Andrew's body. He brutally murdered him and his cat and then he posed them in the most disturbing and abhorrent way. Now it was after Andrew Collier's murder when finally connections started to be made by the police. Initially they connected Andrew's murder to the murder of Peter Walker back in March of 1993. They recognised the similarities in how the killer posed the victim's bodies. If you remember Peter also had condoms stuffed inside his mouth just like Andrew and the killer had also posed two Ted bears in a sex position next to his body. However, one key difference between the two cases was that in the Andrew Collier case, the killer, Colin Ireland, actually slipped up and he left some evidence behind. It transpires that at some point during that night, the night that Andrew Collier was killed, there had actually been a street fight just outside of his flat. And so upon hearing the noise of the fight, Colin Ireland went to the window in Andrew's bedroom and he looked outside. Now, when he did this, it's believed that he put his hands on the window frame. However, later when he was cleaning the scene and he was wiping the surfaces to get rid of his prints, he actually forgot about the window frame. He forgot that he had touched it. And so a few days later when a forensic team was sent in, 
they found something. They found a fingerprint on Andrew Collier's window frame. Of course, they didn't know at the time whose fingerprint it was. They just knew that it wasn't Andrew's. But regardless, this was a huge development for the detectives. They believed that this print was the killer. Unfortunately, back then, back in the early 90s, they obviously didn't have like a computerized fingerprint database. They couldn't put this print into a database to see if there was a match. But at least they had this print they finally have the killer's DNA. They could use this print to test against any future suspects in the investigation. After linking Andrew Collier and Peter Walker's murder, the police did begin to look into the possibility that maybe their killer had more victims. Maybe Christopher Dunn and Perry Bradley were also victims of this one man. So the connections were starting to be made. But it was when the police received a call from the murderer himself that they pretty much confirm this. Following Andrew's murder, Colin Ireland picked up the phone and he called, I think, the police station in Battersea in London. He called them a few days after Andrew's body was found on the 12th of June 1993. And Colin told them on the phone that he was the killer. He obviously didn't give over his name, his identity, but he named all four victims. He said that he was the one who murdered Peter Walker, Christopher Dunn, Perry Bradley and Andrew Collins. Collier and he did this. He rang the police because he wanted to brag about it. I think he wanted to brag about the fact that the police hadn't caught him yet and there is actually a recording of a section of this phone call online so I will insert it now if I can. Why are you doing this? I'm just But what was, what was your aim in all that? police also asked him on the phone why he was killing gay men, why he was targeting specifically homosexuals and he said quote they keep their mouth shut and don't tell the police things, they're despicable and I don't like them. And he also said during the call that he wasn't going to stop, he was a serial killer and he was going to keep committing murder. After receiving this confirmation that all four murders were linked on the 15th of June the detectives decided that it was time to announce to the public that they had a serial killer on their hands. They decided to do this not only because they wanted the public's help in catching this guy, they wanted them to come forward with potential tips and leads, but also because they knew that they had to warn the gay community. They had to warn gay men that there was a serial killer in London who was targeting them. So they addressed the gay community in London and they told them that they needed to be careful and that inviting a stranger back to your home for sex could be dangerous because they had no idea when this murderer was going to strike again. Little did they know at that point when they held the conference that he already had struck again. Colin Ireland had already claimed his fifth victim. Later on the same day that Colin Ireland called the police telling them that he was the killer and that the four murders were linked on the evening of the 12th of June 1993, he was back at the Colham pub and there he caught the attention of a man named Emmanuel Spiteri. Emmanuel was 41 years old, he was of Maltese heritage and he worked as a chef and one documentary I watched actually said that he had met Colin Ireland before just very briefly at the tube station but then they spotted each other again at the Colham pub. Eventually Colin and Emmanuel went back to Emmanuel's flat in Catford in South East London and sadly there Emmanuel suffered the same fate as the previous four victims. Emmanuel was bound and tied to the bed. Some sources say that he was handcuffed. Ireland took Emmanuel's bank card, demanded to know his pin number and then eventually he strangled Emmanuel Spiteri to death with a noose. And I believe afterwards he did his usual routine of, you know, cleaning the flat, collecting any items that he had brought with him, wiping away fingerprints, but that wasn't all he did. In a further attempt to destroy evidence, Colin Island 
actually started a fire in Emmanuel Spiteri's flat and then he left. Although I don't believe the flat was on fire for too long, I think it soon went out, so thankfully no one else in the apartment building was hurt or anything. And three days after Spiteri's murder, Colin Ireland once again called the police and he told them that he had committed a fifth murder. He told them that they should look for a body in a house fire. Again, he was bragging to the police. It was almost like he was mocking them because they hadn't caught him yet. And that same day, Emmanuel Spiteri's body was discovered by his landlady. So now the police had yet another murder inquiry on their hands. They had another victim of this sadistic serial killer, and yet they still weren't really any closer to finding out his identity. The detective soon established that on the night of his murder, Emmanuel Spiteri had been to the Colham pub, just like the other victims. And so they began trying to see if they could trace his steps after he would have left the pub, but most likely with his killer. And they realised that the route he probably would have taken to get home that night would have taken him through Charing Cross Station in London. Now this was potentially very promising for the police because they discovered that Charing Cross Station had very recently been fitted with CCTV cameras. So they hoped that if Emmanuel did go through Charing Cross Station to get home that night, maybe they would be able to spot him on the footage, but not just him, his killer too. And would you believe it? they did. The detective spent hours and hours and hours going through this footage from the station until eventually they spotted Emmanuel Spiteri and he was walking through the station with a very tall man. So this was a huge breakthrough for the police. They finally had an image of the man that probably killed Emmanuel. They had a CCTV image of the serial killer. So this CCTV image was quickly released to the public along with an e-fit that had been made of the killer's face. The police were obviously hoping that someone would recognise this man and come forward with his name. Now we know that this man, the man walking with Emmanuel Spiteri, was Colin Ireland. And Colin panicked when he saw these images in the media. He obviously didn't realise that Charing Cross Station had CCTV and he knew that it was now probably only a matter of time before the police identified him. It turns out actually that even Colin's own friends had been saying to him after this image and the EFIT was released that, oh, it looks quite like you, Colin. So he knew it was only a matter of time before the police came knocking on his door. And so Colin made a decision a decision to try and almost get one step ahead of the detectives. On the 19th of July, 1993, just a week after he committed his fifth murder, Colin Island went to see a solicitor in Southend. And there he gave the solicitor a statement, a statement in which he admitted that he was the guy in the CCTV image. He admitted that he was the one walking through Charing Cross Station with Emmanuel Spiteri on the night that Emmanuel was killed. However, he claimed that he wasn't the one who murdered him. Colin Ireland's story was that that night, the night of the 12th of June, he went to the Colham pub, he met Emmanuel there, and they agreed to go back to his flat. So they took a train to Charing Cross together, and when they arrived, there was another man in the flat and he said that it was then when it became clear to him that Emmanuel and this other guy were interested in having a threesome. But Colin didn't want to, he wasn't interested in that and so he just left. He left Emmanuel and this man in the flat and he claimed that the last time he saw Emmanuel, he was alive. So he was basically suggesting that this other man in the flat must have killed Emmanuel because it was not him. And after he gave this statement to his solicitor, the solicitor contacted the police who immediately arrested Colin Ireland on suspicion of murder. Now one of the very first things the police did was obviously send Colin Ireland's fingerprints off for analysis. They wanted to compare his prints to the print that they had obtained from Andrew Collier's window frame, the print that they believed had been left behind by the murderer. And when they did this and they compared the prints, what do you know? It was an exact match. But during his interview, Colin Ireland denied the murders. He said no comment a lot, that he was not the serial killer, and that he had not been inside the full victim, Andrew Collier's flat. Wow, this fingerprint now proved otherwise. It proved 
that he was lying and that he really was the man that the police had been looking for. Although at this moment in time, they didn't charge him with all five murders. They strongly believed that he had committed all five, but they didn't charge him with all five. They charged him with two, the murder of Andrew Collier and the murder of Emmanuel Spiteri. Now, the reason for this was because, well, number one, they didn't actually have enough evidence to charge him with the first three. They only had solid evidence to charge him with the murders of the last two victims. But also they only charged him with two because the police had a theory that if they did that, Colin might actually confess. You see, they knew from the killer's phone calls to the Sun newspaper and the police that the murderer was proud of what he had done. To him, these murders were something to brag about. And as we know, he would get annoyed with the police. He got so frustrated because they took so long to connect the murders. And he hated that because he wanted notoriety. He wanted to see it reported in the press and the media that there was a serial killer in London. So the police thought that if they charged him with just two murders, maybe he would get angry again. Of course, you have to be charged with at least three murders to be dubbed a serial killer. So they thought if they charged him with two, he would get annoyed and eventually he might confess because he would want that serial killer title. And you know what? He took the bait. He did exactly that. Less than a month after he was first arrested and charged, Colin Ireland sat down with the detectives and he confessed to every single murder. He admitted that he was the one who killed Peter Walker, Christopher Dunn, Perry Bradley, Andrew Collier and Emmanuel Spiteri. He made a lengthy confession. He talked them through every single murder in detail and he was so so calm and so cold when he was talking about these killings. He clearly had no remorse whatsoever. He felt no guilt. He was talking about these horrific, brutal murders, like you would talk about something as mundane as like the weather and there are actually video clips of his confession online so again if i can i'll include some now i uh, i put the, i killed him with a plastic bag uh, i put that over his head and killed him with that he barely come to us quite quick i, I told him with the noose and he hardly struggled and um, um some for instance walker it took longer tell me about the cat how did you kill the cat i um stuck a noose around his neck Hung it over a door. Tell me again how Christopher Dunn died. Christopher Dunn, I, 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 with, with, with some, with some cord and manual strangulation. The detectives asked Ireland during his interview about his motive for these murders, why he decided to kill these men, why he targeted gay men. They asked him if he was gay himself and were these killings sexually motivated, although just as a side note, I don't believe any of the victims were sexually assaulted by Colin, but of course that doesn't necessarily mean that there wasn't a sexual element to the crime. Maybe he got enough sexual enjoyment, sexual gratification, out of brutally murdering them. He didn't feel the need to sexually assault them. So they asked him in his interviews if he was a homosexual or bisexual, but he was adamant that he was not. As I said earlier, he always maintained that he was not gay and that he only targeted gay men because, number one, he didn't like them, he was homophobic, and number two, because he thought that they were easy targets. He believed that he could trick them by acting like he was into S&M so that he could tie them up and restrain them and then it would be easier for him to murder them. Following his confession, Colin Ireland was charged with all five murders and when it came to his court proceedings, he pleaded guilty to every single one, which obviously meant that there was no need for him to go to trial. He just had to be sentenced. And on the 20th of December, 1993, he was given five life sentences for his crimes. Although I believe this was later changed to just a whole life order. So he was never, ever, ever going to be released. And during his sentencing, the judge said about Colin Ireland's murders, quote, to take one human life is an outrage. 
rage. To take five is carnage. After he was sentenced, Colin Ireland was sent to Wakefield Prison in West Yorkshire and he spent just under two decades there until his death in February of 2012. At the time he would have been around 57 years old and he apparently died of natural causes. 14 years after Colin Ireland's murder spree in May of 2007 there was I think basically a review into the police investigation of the Colin Ireland murders because as I've said a few times in this video it did take the police a while to to connect these murders longer than it should have and in May of 2007 a report by the LGBT advisory group found that quote the investigation into the serial murders by Colin Ireland was hampered by a lack of knowledge of the gay scene in London and the special culture of S&M slash bondage in particular valuable time was lost before the police managed to recognize two common threads to the crimes these links were established only after the death of of the fourth victim, Andrew Collier. I believe the two common threads that the report refers to there is the fact that the victims were all last seen in the Colham pub and the fact that the way in which the bodies were found were all very similar. The police had that knowledge and yet they still failed for a long time to realise that these crimes were connected. And because it took them quite a while to connect them, it meant that they only really warned the public, the gay community, when it was too late. As I understand it, all five murders had already been committed by the time they held a press conference to warn gay men in London. Had they made the connections earlier, they could have issued the warning way earlier and maybe some of the last few victims could have been saved because they would have known to be a bit more cautious. The report concluded that the investigation into these murders was a quote serious failure of policing and many people believe that homophobia in the police force may have played a part in that and I think we can only hope that the police team involved with this crime and also I think just police forces all over the UK learned from this horrific case and that going forward they changed the way they handled criminal cases involving the LGBTQ plus community. But that concludes this case. That is the case of the sadistic serial killer, the gay slayer, Colin Ireland. A really, really frustrating and tragic case. You cannot imagine the terror that these poor men must have experienced when the penny dropped and they realised that they were about to die. When they realised that the man that they had brought home was about to kill them. It's horrifying. As always, please do let me know your thoughts on this case in the comments. I want to hear your opinions. Also feel free to let me know of any other cases that you want to see me cover on this channel. A quick thank you once again to BBC iPlayer for kindly sponsoring this video. Remember that if you want to watch my Insta Scammer Friend or any other program that BBC iPlayer has to offer then you can scan the QR code that is on the screen right now or alternatively you can click the link in the description box. Thank you all so so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye!